Hi coaches, I'm Kristen Coombs from England. I'd like to introduce your next speakers, Andy Wood and Alistair Hyam, authors of The Winning Edge in Badminton, to discuss the art of competing and getting your players to seize crucial moments. Enjoy. Good evening, everybody. My name's Andy Wood, and thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us this evening, um, talking about momentum, match flow, and the art of competing, to introduce to you our book that we've just written as well on the subject. I consider myself one of the luckiest men alive. Um, I've managed to uh, play this game competitively for a living, and then coach it for close to 45 years. Um, and. Uh, um, my good friends would say I've never done an honest day's work in my life, and they're probably right, but as in the badminton world, we know so differently. It's a fabulous sport, and it's a joy to be a part of it, and great to come to talk to you about some of our experiences this evening. We've put um, this picture up here. It's the pinnacle of our sport in Olympic Games. This is 2008 in the Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing. Huge crowd. Um, full stadium, opening ceremony, and with a few athletes there that um, feature prominently in some of our research and our work. There's Nathan Robertson, Gail Ems, Anthony Clark, and Donna Kellogg, and I know a lot of you will be familiar with those and their journey. I had the great fortune of learning as a coach, um, being very heavily involved in their junior development and following their careers all the way through to them winning world uh, Olympic, European, and Commonwealth medals. And um, I obviously made an awful lot of mistakes along the way, was challenged to find a lot of solutions, and I genuinely believe that that was a great journey and learning process for myself as a coach. Great. Uh, my name is Alistair Hyam. Uh, my background is tennis. Uh, I began as a club coach and then a county coach, national coach, international coach, and I was head of coach education for the LTA. Uh, and since uh, leaving the LTA to do coach education, I worked on my own project, then I've returned to do university tennis. I'm responsible for all elements of university tennis, including captain the Great Britain team. That says having beaten America, the US college team, in 2017, and we've won 11 major medals in the last uh, six years. And that involves sitting on the court. So my expertise is match flow and momentum, work in tennis, football, badminton. Uh, Andy is really the badminton expert, so don't ask me too many questions on badminton. Uh, but we're going to work together, we're going to work a twin approach. I'm going to bring perhaps some of the principles that we've worked together, and Andy will bring it together with the, uh, the badminton side of things. As mentioned, we have a book, we'll be selling it later, uh, chance to buy it today, save some postage if you like. Um, and really Andy's going to talk a little bit about how the book came about and uh, our relationship and where it came from. So I guess the catalyst in many ways was the Sydney 2000 Olympics. Um, and uh, as, a, as a early on in my coach, quite very excited to be at first Olympic Games and see the magnitude of the event and who we were in the semi-finals, Simon Archer and Joanne Good playing against Trikas and Timor, Indonesia. Uh, and Simon and Joe were playing out of their skins, supremely confident and looked unbeatable. So here we were, Great Britain going, surely, going for a gold or silver medal the very next day. Um, something unheard of in, in Great Britain. Couldn't really happen, never had a medal before. 15-2, uh, first game. 10-1, second game. That sounds alien to a lot of you, but that's how we scored. And with, um, you had to win a point to score a point. So that was the system then. It was impossible to lose from them, surely. How can you lose with such a lead? Unheard of. And a couple of things fairly insignificant happened in the match, and I'm in the coach's chair, and I'm actually thinking, oh my God, we're in serious trouble here. And sure enough, the match evolved, it became a cliffhanger, it went all the way to the wire, and we did lose the match. Um, and it left me distraught as a coach, obviously Simon and Joe distraught, had to come back the very next day to try and fight for the first medal, uh, a bronze medal, um, and I'll come back to that a little bit later on in the presentation, but um, it was a lot of soul-searching, a lot of review, a lot of research. How could it possibly happen? 
and I, I went back through all my notes, and instead of looking at technique or physicality, I often found myself saying impose, key moments, turning point, energy now, start fast. Um, and that led me to search out Alistair, who I knew had done a lot of work in momentum and match flow, and that started our collaboration. Great, thanks Andy. And so today, these are the aims. We're going to try and uh, talk to you about match flow momentum. We're talking about the balance of a match. We'd like you to think about how you talk to your players, the language you use for your players. Uh, we need to establish that, really, helpfully, hopefully to establish the demands of the game so they understand the demands of the game. We know you're all teaching forehands, backhands, serve, return, etc. But actually, the demands of the game, what's happening in the match, how are they recovering, how are they making leads, etc. Uh, and present some strategies for game management. And really, uh, we'd sort of say, I, I sort of feel we should be mining the gap. And that's, a, you know, you see that in the metro in London, um, the actual gap between the train and the pavement. But the gap that I'm talking about is between what I felt as a player playing and what I was watching my players in matches and what I was coaching. And there was a gap between the two. So very often, what do we see in matches? Well, we see lower ranked players beating higher ranked players. We see players winning critical sequences of matches. We see gamesmanship. We see people creating leads, making comebacks, failing to see a match turning, matches turning on a dime. Um, that's an American phrase, suddenly turning on a small thing. Players not closing out matches and making slow starts. In um, Beijing Olympics, Nathan Roberts and Gail Ems playing a match against Zengbo and Gao Ling in a stadium full of Chinese supporters, 99%, just a few squeaky voices from their mums, I think, and uh, no complete noise. China, Chai Yo, was the, was the drum sound. And uh, it... Uh, Somehow, it was almost uh, one of the moments of magic again that we've all been through as coaches when we've seen something strange happen. And um, uh, it was, uh, they played well first game, second game, China has always came back and dominated. And they were looking like they were overcome. 17 11 down in the third. And uh, that's it. I thought it's all over. Our dream is all over. Um, and something strange. The crowd was got noisier, but almost the eerie silence. Nathan hits a couple of winning smashes. Could he, maybe, perhaps there's a chance. Uh, Zengbo Gaolin got a little bit nervous, and a few more points, 17 all, 18 all. But it was more the eerie silence. It was a bit like when the Lionesses scored in the Melbourne Stadium against Australia the other day, complete silence. But there was almost a mystical flow, a piece of magic that went round. It was nothing to do with physicality or technique or even tactics. There was an energy there that we needed to exploit more. And so, what are we coaching? Well, if, like us, you'll be obviously coaching technique, you'll be coaching shot selection, tactical patterns, physical conditions. We're not saying it's not important to coach those. Of course, it's important to coach those. But what's the gap? What could we be coaching? Well, we could be building an awareness of match flow and momentum. Um, we could be coaching how to build momentum, how to gain momentum, how to maintain momentum, and then how to regain it. And particularly important, we should be bringing the matches that the, the players have learned from the matches. If you don't always have a chance to watch matches, you need to bring the, um, the lessons from that matches into your coaching program, your learning program. Otherwise, that's a, a missed opportunity. So, how can we coach game management? Well, first of all, I mean, there's a number of steps. If we had more time, we'd go through it. This presentation is normally can be three hours, four hours a day uh, with uh, on-court work. Today, we've got 45 minutes. So, all we can do, really do is introduce it. A lot of the other things are in the book, but it's really an introduction. And we're going to try and tackle perhaps the first three to establish a common language, make sure everybody knows what we're talking about, look at the demands of the game, and develop strategies uh, with game management by adapting their games in the different phases of the match. We, um, through the Great Britain program, we certainly adapted things at that point quite significantly. Uh, the feedback, evaluation, and reviews, which was a massive part of our program three times a day, is very easy to train hard, but not easy to train wisely. And we introduced an awful lot of 
uh, examination on match score lines and match flow, where were the runs of points, how fast were we coming out at the start, how did we respond after breaks, and we promoted a dialogue amongst the players so that they knew they would be engaged and judged and challenged on managing those situations so much better, and it became a critical part of the review and feedback process. So we talk, coaching about talking about. Uh, we'll begin by looking at the language and how to talk about the game. So we're talking about the balance of a match. And this chart here, it's not a, a scientific chart. It's just to show the journey that a match can go through. And I'm sure you recognize that journey. Things going well, a little bit of a blip, then a recover, and go on. And we call this match draw. We talk about it in the book. It's a chance to get your players, you know to draw the match, quite simply, and you can draw it and see if they match up, see if they, you see the same turning points. Broadly speaking, if the chart's going up, momentum's going for you, you feel like you're progressing in the match. If it goes down from your point of play, view, from your player's point of view, it's going against you. If it's turned, that may, may be a significant event where both standards change. But that's the basic chart. It's looking at it from a third party point of view. So it's not the momentum of one player, it's the balance of both. It's the balance of the match, the momentum of the match. And we know that uh, the world is full of data. And data-driven coaching is massive, being informed about the data. Data is being used in badminton, as we see there. In tennis, this is a quick video from Tennis Viz. Tennis Viz work with the ATP but also with Hawkeye uh, and also with IBM data. So I know the guys, I work with the guys from Tennis Fizz. They're coming up with amazing stuff now. You can see each shot now is analyzed, the height over the net, the speed, the height of the bounce, where it's landing in the court. They combine all this data from Hawkeye to come up with a, a score out of 10 for each shot. So you can see there, shot quality six, shot quality eight, shot quality seven. If you can't see it, that's what it's saying. And it's doing all these calculations to come up with a uh, shot quality for each shot. So we know this, and it's, it's, going, uh, it's, going mad, you know, it's going mad. Actually, too much to take in in some ways. So this is yeah, a, a tennis, vid, tennis viz video. And they're using it for all kinds of things. They're using it at a player level. They're using it as a player comparison level. They're using it as a, uh, a, a, a looking at the, who they're going to play for the opposition, the scouting. They're using it for betting, of course. And they're using it for uh, data analysis for, to uh, decide the baseline for each shot across the whole of the game. But the journeys stay the same. And the reasons we watch badminton today, it's the reasons we always watch badminton. Okay? So despite all this minutiae and the data and all the, everything that's coming at us, the journeys is what we're talking about today. We're actually going up a level. We're talking about the bigger picture. So you can read the road ahead, look upstream, as Ben was saying, see what's happening. So it's not just about the data. We know that's there. We're not saying that's not important. It is important, of course. But we're really trying to get across the bigger picture of the match. Oh, sorry, Andrew. Was Go back for you. Okay. Just, um, just another short, very quick story um, about an opportunity to influence momentum and the other ingredients into crucial matches was, again, Simon Archer, uh, and it was in the sh shrine of badminton, let's say the holy shrine at Astora Sanaya in Jakarta, Indonesian Open semi-finals. And um, as, you, as often there was um, tanks and soldiers and frenzy in the stadium, crisis outside, civil unrest, and we were obviously looking after the British team. Semi-final day, we'd arrived there. The crowd was already in their seats two hours before. As you well know, the atmosphere is just incredible. Singing, dancing, uh, even though there was nothing on, on play. Looking forward to the badminton ahead. We arrived, one of our players tripped to, on entry and derision in the stadium, so you knew it was going to be a hostile environment that day. Simon and Joe just won their mixed semi-final. I think it was against Bam Bang and Rosalina, and were playing the final the next day. But I was more concerned about getting our team out safely, getting them onto transport, starting recovery. But it was also a frenzy in there. Couldn't get Simon to leave the stadium. He was out talking to the crowd. He was giving rackets away, signing autographs, throwing shirts into the crowd, fighting over it. And I went up to him and said, come on, we need to get out of here. It's not. It's not the safest environment, and we've got matches tomorrow. No, no, I really need to stay here because um, we're playing Danish pair, Sulgard and Olsen, the next day, and I need, I need the crowd on my side. And uh, absolutely clear what his strategy was. Um, and sure enough, 
left him to it. We got home safely, we played the match the next day, got really tight in the third, and I think the crowd helped him over the line. So managing that situation was important. And that's a great example that the top players are aware of what could influence the match. So we as coaches, yes, forehands, yes, backhands, but then there's this next level. There's this the, uh, how a match can develop and the things that can impact the match. And that's a great story of how Simon Archer looked at that and knew about that, even perhaps uh, instinctively. So the language of momentum, match for momentum, I'm sure you all know, it's uh, describing the state of the game. Um, and you know, how would you describe the journey of the match? If we had more time, we'd be a bit interactive, see how you thought about matches, to find out what your thoughts were. But you know, think, maybe you can think about that over a beer later. How would you describe a match? How would you describe a match to somebody who didn't play? What would you describe the experience of a match? If you were in the bar, describing it. You can try it later. Pretend you know nothing about badminton. How do you describe to somebody who's never played a match what is the experience of the match going to be? You could ask your players as well. It's really uh, interesting. It throws up some interesting points. But here is uh, you know, some real life. Listen to the commentary on this and you'll hear how the commentators describe it. Four chances to get through to tomorrow's final and take out China with a stroke. Great, and before I just says a word, I think that really highlights the emotion and also the, um, the, how, how it goes in runs. You see the runs of score. So I know we're talking about the data and the minutia, and everybody says little things make a difference, but yet we still see runs of points that go one way. And in tennis, you'll see six love and then love six some, sometimes. So yes, it's close, but we need to understand the bigger picture. And thanks to Greg for putting, helping us put that video together. Yeah, to the audience. yeah sorry, Greg, Mayers, and Jenny Moore. Uh, Featured there, um, doing a great job on badminton insects, by the way. That's awesome. Um, it's happening so frequently. Some good footage there, City Amman Cup and the All England. Um, and we better get wise at managing that so we can uh, capitalise upon it. Um, a couple of examples that we perhaps used, um, Great Britain badminton, we realised we were losing an awful lot of matches, 21-19, 21-18. Um, especially to China and Korea, who notoriously were very, very fast at the start. Um, we tried to think, well, look back through my notes, and I realized that um, it was very often that the little runs of points were three love at the start, or four one, five two. Um, and the rest of the game was pretty much neck and neck. Um, and we were actually losing matches 21 18, 21 19 based on the start. So we just devised a program to get much sharper out of the blocks, much faster, a much more cognitive decision-making, problem-solving warm-up with a lot of intensity. And we challenged the players to win the first five-point game and make sure that we were in the face of our opponents right from the start, not the good old British culture of let's see how it goes and then we'll react. 
you know, so that was one thing. We had another one there, which one player, Gail M's, based whole game on confidence, and so we could manufacture a really big in to a match very early on. She could go on and be brilliant and completely control the court, or she could be average and um, not necessarily able to dominate, and her partner certainly needed the former. So we really tried to get a big in very early, an interception, a serve, an interception, or a, a step up on the man smash and destroy it, because that had a huge impact on her being able to control the match. Great, and those are good examples. And from no, that point of view, actually identifying the matches going down, if you think about that chart, and by Andy doing that, and thinking about the bigger picture, that allows for you to come up with that intervention. And you'll, you'll hear the commentators talk all, all the time. I mean, we're in, De in Denmark, there's a few seafaring phrases here. Plain sailing, I don't know how it well, well it translates for the international audience, but you hear that. You hear they have to weather the storm. If they're going through a difficult part of the match, you hear the commentator saying, weather the storm. And you know, if you're listening to this and you don't understand, you think, why are they talking about storms? Why are they talking about plain sailing? But they're describing the phases of the match. And another one, uh, they're gaining the upper hand, which means you know, they're gaining the control of the match. So, how do matches develop? We're talking about this. Well, you could say that broadly in one of three stages, momentum is for you, things are feeling good, momentum's in the balance, or momentum is against you. And um, Beyond that, you can identify sometimes turning points, or as we would say, potential turning points, when things turn. So a turning point in that graph would be when it may be going well and it turns, or it's going badly and it turns. So we'll talk about those in a moment. And sometimes you get these surges of momentum, often a short period of time where everything seems to turn on its head, either for you or against you. And what's the strategy for when that happens? That's what we need to be understanding and talking through with our players. Um, this is the graph we saw earlier. We've actually got some, move, some graphs that move. So hopefully you'll be familiar with this one. Everything's going great. It's all going well. You play, you're sitting back, relaxing. Perhaps you're just having a coffee, you're watching. Then something should happen. Uh-oh, down the other side we go. So I think we all recognize that. You've probably played matches yourself like that, experienced and seen your players play them. And that's that big, classic, roller coaster where you get to the top everything's going well and then something happens perhaps at a crucial moment combined with the score missed opportunity perhaps and then woomph, everything seems to pull about as one player goes gets worse and worse and the other player gets better and better here's another more subtle version this is a serena williams match and you might you know you can show these um, so these matches are in the book, you can show them to your players and ask what you think happened. I've done this with 12-year-olds, 13, 14-year-olds. I said, how do you think this pattern came about? So have a think. How do you think it came about? Serena Williams against a lesser player at the French Open. So we haven't got a lot of time, so I'll not ask you to, but perhaps some of you will recognize some of the things. Why did Serena go down? Well, perhaps she was nervous. Perhaps she didn't know the opposition because it was an unknown player. Perhaps the other player was playing fantastic, relaxed, nothing to lose, loving the fact she's playing Serena at the French Open. Then in the middle, perhaps Serena found the tactics, got annoyed, got psyched up because the match is coming to an end. And perhaps the opposition got a bit nervous, gave them a chance to choke, missed their opportunity, Serena found the tactics, the opposition felt they'd had their chance and fell away, and Serena goes on to win six love in the final set. And did you have a badminton example of that or something? Yeah, similar? I mean, back to the Sydney 2000, 15, 2, 10, 1, danger, sitting coach's chair, danger, and fairly, two fairly significant things happened and, and shows such fine lines. I think Simon had known that um, he had to serve low throughout the whole match to have a chance. If he gave Trickers time, um, he would be in trouble. And um, Simon wasn't the most confident on his low serve, so he'd done it impeccably up until this stage. And Joe knew that she could not give the tape away at all for Trickers to control, the most skillful player perhaps some of us ever seen. And uh, he could obliterate you again through the tape. So she was stepping in and killing everything. But then two consecutive points, one flick serve from Simon, and one interception from Joe, which she had been just decking, now she dropped a little bit, tried to play a tight net shot. If that had happened, perhaps one or two points afterwards, I think they'd have got over the line. But what ensued was a glimmer of um, possibility from Trickus, 
and uh, a slight lack of confidence from ours for one minuscule moment in a battle, neck and neck, and uh, all the way through. In fact, they did have a, a match point in the second game, um, but inevitably they ran out just losing that match and distraught from it. I think Michael Sogard and Ricky Olsen in the other semi-final against Sang Jung Gao Ling also had a match point to go into the final. And then the very next day in the bronze medal playoff, Sogard Olsen had a, a, a match point against Simon and Joe as well. So that's the fine lines amongst those four players for the gold, silver, bronze medals. Um, so critical. And, and, and the point is, you know, working from match to match. And, you know, in the last talk, we had a, a great example from Ben, the question from the German coach at the front. You know, what are you looking for in a coach? It's hard work. I suppose my challenge to you is how hard are you working to incorporate the lessons from the matches into your coaching? So by getting, even just by getting your players to draw the match, it opens a discussion. You can say, what happened there? What happened here? And then you can understand more. Because if your experience is like my experience, if you, don't, if you didn't watch a match, and you say to them, how did it go? They'll say, oh, I just played well, or I just played badly, or I wasn't on form. And I'm thinking, if I was there, I would have written perhaps two pages of notes. And I get, I just played badly, four words. So these, this way, uh, and some questions that we would also suggest as well, like asking them, which phases of the match do you think you played well in? What did you do differently? Was there any significant match events which could have turned the match around? How did you respond? And getting them to think about this, that's you working hard to incorporate the lessons from the matches into the training so that your coaching program, your learning program is not parallel and separate from matches with just a quick check-in. It becomes integrated as football, basketball, netball, hockey all do because they coach for the match at the weekend. And I think that's certainly a problem we have in tennis at the moment. There's not enough coaching and lessons from the matches brought back into the coaching. So when momentum's for you, um, how does it feel? I think you all know, it feels you're in control. Lucky things seem to happen. Everything seems big. Time your shots beautifully. Tactically, decisions are easy, small things. Uh, don't get on your nerves. There's a sense of inevitability about winning, okay? And when momentum's, oh, here's a, a quote from Peter Gader. When momentum's for you, you see solutions, not limitations, because in the book, we interviewed uh, some of the top players in badminton, some top coaches, and there's a lot of quotes and experiences in there from those players. Um, when momentum's against you, we can see in the body language already, we've all felt like that. Um, it's the opposite. Things feel unsettled, nothing seems to work. It's an uphill struggle. It's like you're running in treacle. Nothing seems to work, and you want to rush to make it better. I was really interested in, in Ben's point about when a player makes a mistake in football, they want to rush and make things better. Actually, that's some of the worst things you can do. And it's great advice just to take your time and actually really get back to the basics when uh, momentum is against you for a whole variety of reasons. And in the book, we suggest things you can do in each of these categories. Of course, we're just describing the categories here without too many solutions. Most of the solutions and suggestions, because of the time we've got, are in the book. Um, and a quote from oh. Gail, who you worked with, Andy? Just another quote for you here uh, from Gail Ems. I feel a slump in my body language, and I look to my coach for help. Um, and an example of that would be in the 2004 Olympic final. They'd um, set the nation alight, the British public, and they'd gone all the way to the Athens final. Here they were, playing for gold and silver. Um, and uh, they, it was where they really announced themselves to the world as serious contenders. And um, they had the most uh, obliterated first game. Uh, Seng Jung Gao Ling came out incredible. I've never seen anything like it. The speed of power was peppering Gail, hitting body and not getting a racket on it. She was quick. And anything Nathan tried to do to the net was just decimated by Gao Ling. And um, I was running onto the court for the break uh, to try and figure out a way to turn the shell shock around. And I was also shell shocked. Um, and uh, it, um, the, the way they managed to claw their way back into that match and almost find a solution, it went, they managed to steal the second game and it went neck and neck in the third and uh, inevitably Zhang Zhang Gaoling got over the line. But uh, it was remarkable, um, their strength of character to somehow find solutions and figure out ways to manage that situation. 
So we come to turning points. We mentioned those, the time when the match can turn around. And um, just got some examples here. But basically, the, it's the significant match events that have the potential to turn the match around. And I do a lot of work with a sports psychologist, Anna Suarez from Portugal. She's doing a PhD into turning points at the moment because a lot of it's mental. It can be tactical, of course. It can be a score. It can be a missed opportunity. But actually, it's your response to the match events that really um, matters as opposed to the event itself. Um, we see some fantastically uh, common turning points, missed opportunities, bad line calls, broken string in your favorite racket. And then we see some not so common one. And I think Andy's got a great story about something that happened which turned a match around uh, for one of your players. Oh, uh, a slightly unusual one, Swiss Open. Uh, Charles runs a fabulous tournament there, VIP section, and um, beautifully attired the arena with flowers. And, um, and one of our players, Donna Kellogg, um, who was the nicest girl in the world, off court, crossed the white lines, turns into a competitive monster. She was remonstrating with the umpire at the foot of the umpire's chair, I think for the third time, uh, and she wasn't getting the answers that she wanted. Uh, steam coming out of her head, and almost in a split second, her racket moved faster than it had done in the game, like lightning. And this beautiful sunflower that stood head and shoulders above all the other flowers was clipped with ferocity and sent it spiraling into the stands and landed on one fine gentleman in the VIP seats and it was like a hush around the stadium and what happened next was very strange because you'd expect her to receive all kinds of drama from that from the officials but it was almost a humour and it certainly was a massive weight off her shoulders uh, the opponents were slightly distracted and they found a way to get back into the match and turn it around so not all turning points are the same not that we're recommending you go looking for sunflowers and taking the head off them, but the, the idea is that you know, something to turn the match around can create a change in energy and a change in performance. And that's a, a great example, slightly um, different example. But the common examples are the same thing. When you miss an opportunity, if you go down a level, when they go up a level, that's the switch in momentum. And it's that ability to not let that happen, to hold your performance that stops a switch in momentum, or to step on the up the gears and change the match around if you have that opportunity. But you have to see them coming as well. Again, it's in the book, read the road ahead, Look, have your radar on for significant match events that could turn around. You'll see some players, you think that's a great chance to turn the match around, and they just carry on with their head down, they don't see it. See other players, you know, blind to the fact that the match is about to turn, and they just, and they, they miss responding at the critical moment. So they have to have a a radar for these potential turning points because you can capitalize, make a comeback, or a kill, off, kill off a match and stop somebody from coming back if you have that awareness. And again from Peter Gaeda, learn to welcome distractions, to use them as a weapon against my opposition. I mean, that's just such a great quote, and it's a different way. We talked here about Ben talk about reframing. How do you look at things? In the middle of opportunity, difficulty lies opportunity. In the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. And that's speaking to that um, exact thing there. And so Charting momentum, I don't know how it's done in badminton, we do a lot of it in tennis. Basically, that's a system of uh, going up a point and down a point on a, a graph. It's explained how to do it again in the book, we'll not go too much into it. But it allows you to see the pattern of the match, but also to make some notes in real time as the match e un events unfold. And that's really what we're talking about here. A match is not a static thing. It's not a comparison of two standards. Otherwise, we wouldn't watch. We'd just go, that's the higher ranked player, that's the lower ranked player, game over. But we know that's not going to happen. It's going to go through phases. And we need to, as coaches, understand how our players respond in the different phases, what happened. Because there are things we can learn and teach them about their own individual responses, about matches in general, where the opportunities lie, and about you know, what was good from the opposition to give them praise. Because if you only look at your own performance, you probably kill yourself, uh, probably, it'll probably kill you. Because you need to keep that balance and understand what's going on at both sides of the net. I think um, this is an example, many methods to chart matches and certainly use several throughout our process, but it was uh, a way of um, organizing the team and all being on one message, even the ones that weren't at the venue. Um, but what it, what it definitely did to us was as well um, bring on the, the, the critical nature of having to have a chair strategy. So in badminton, we've got a chance of five coaching breaks almost to impact a match, and we also needed to look at 
detail, fine detail in the preparation. So if the coach athlete um, offering around a match could have an impact in match flow, we needed, we better make sure it was as effective and maximized as it possibly could be. Um, so that meant being absolutely clear on roles and responsibilities. If you've got two coaches in the chairs, is one a motivator and one a technical advice giver? Um, are the athletes ready for motivation, inspiration? Can they take technique? Or are they too emotively involved, so they need emotional pull-up? What is your strategy around the chair and then once you've ascertained that how soon before the match for motivational videos for tactics when do I want to engage with my coach with my partner how do we do our warm-ups and let's make that huge impact and then I guess in break one the first uh, 11 points you've got a chance to reaffirm strategy to get your first look at your opponents um, to see if they are on Fit, full fitness and following the tactical plan that you ex in, imagined. Um, you've calm, composed state, I would say, at that point for a coach. Nothing's to panic about. Uh, and it's definitely a reminder of the key points. In break two, at the end of the game, I guess the first blows have been struck. Still calm and relaxed, still reinforcing strategy. Uh, are we going to be an actor or reactor? Um, and I think you may well have some key words uh, that you've organized between yourselves, so there'd be some key word reminders. In, in break three, uh, middle of the second game, again, a calm focus, but with an intensity. The match is revealing itself, and uh, things are coming clear. There's a sense of realization, both athlete and coach, and coaches are very capable of going higher than they want to on their own emotional bandwidth when engaging with athletes as well. So this is for both, really. Um, and I think there's also a level of uh, acceptance levels, too, that needs to be assessed. And really make sure your athletes have got the clarity of thinking. Break four. I think um, there's like a a controlled urgency, um, the end of the second game when it looks like we're going to three. Uh, this high motivation at that point. Um, and uh, I guess there's a need to really reinforce body language as well with your athlete and coach. Um, and a need to impose early in the third game. Um, and, and again, because of the emotion involved, the clarity on thoughts, thought processes, and tactical capability. And then in the mid-game interval, in the final game, uh, this is your last chance saloon. The match has almost revealed itself. It's now or never. Um, and I think from my perspective, it would generally bring a focused intensity, um, a high motivation, and a real sense of trust um, uh, and belief in the player as well. So those would be examples of clarity around a chair strategy and potential to enhance the performance impact. And that's great. And that's th that chair strategy, those, in those five interventions sort of also describe how a match is developing and we know it's going to develop. And so the changing. And it also reminds me of what Ben was saying about ABCs and how you approach the behavior and then the c conversation. But the conversation, as you will have heard there, is not a technical conversation. It's not a physical conversation of the four performance factors. We come back to what we said at the start. The things that you can change, affect consciously in a match, are tactical and mental. So a lot of what Andy was saying there fell into those two categories, as well as following the, the ABC approach, uh, behavior and conversation. Great. Well, we're more or less uh, on time there, I think. Uh, 30 seconds left, just say we do workshops, of course. So if you're ever interested in your association, uh, we do that across the world in all, all the different sports because, as you can see, there's some transferable um, principles. We do it to players, to clubs, to associations. Um, also over the internet now, of course, with um, Zoom. Um, and we'd love to see you in a foyer if you're interested in the book or you want to ask us some questions. Uh, we'll be up there in just a few minutes' time. So. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.